And so that's really what we've been talking about for the last decade is how you can start building wealth and investing early while conquering your student loans and getting out of debt at the same time. Welcome to the Real Estate Marathon Podcast, your guide in the race to financial freedom through real estate investing and sound financial practices. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about real estate investing, personal finances, and a new take on traditional retirement. Now, here are your hosts, Larry Fierro and Mike Moe. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Real Estate Marathon podcast, your guide on the race to financial freedom through real estate investing and sound financial practices. My name is Mike Mo, one of the hosts of the show. Joined today with my partner in crime, the credit score king, Mr. Fierro. What's up, man? You know, Mike, I'm never going to get tired of you calling me the credit score king. That's just phenomenal. I'm actually going to have that put on my business cards, I think. Heck yeah, you should, man. I'm going to. But no, doing well tonight. Doing well tonight. Look. Very excited about the the uh, interview that we had earlier in the week that we're we're getting ready to show everybody. Yes, yeah, man, I am pumped about this one as well. As we were discussing before we hit that uh, record button, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart, um, and uh, a lot of people can relate to. Man, it's student loans and student debt, um, and kind of how to how to dig your way out of that uh, that that hole that a lot of people find themselves in nowadays. Yeah, well, the student loan, the amount of student loans in the in the country today is turned into epidemic proportions. I mean, you've got got kids coming out of college this year in more debt than I think they've ever seen in in previous years. So that's just one of those things that that uh, this this guest that came on to the podcast is going to try and help you figure out and get a handle on. Yeah, for sure, man. And and honestly, it's a, it's a crime that we, you know, the kids nowadays, they're 18, 19 years old, and they're signing for six figures of debt, and they don't even know what that means. So it's, you know, we got to do as much as we can to give them as many tools as possible um, to get themselves out of this, they're essentially signing loans of six figures plus with, with no collateral to it other than their ability to make money in the future. Right. So yeah, man, it's, it's, it's crazy out there. So hopefully this will help people maybe assess their financial situation a little bit as it comes to student loans and maybe get out of it um, a little bit quicker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've got the, the warm up queued up here and uh, you know what the warm up we're doing today is student loan consolidation. And Mike, what student loan consolidation is, is it's the process through which you take out a new loan, which is then used to pay off all your other existing student loans. Instead of having multiple loans and multiple loan payments, you have only one. You can consolidate all federal student loans and most private student loans into one loan. Yeah. Yep. So like Robert said on the show, like when you have six figures in student loan debt, you don't have just one loan. You typically have eight, nine, 10, or 11 different, um, you know, different loan providers who have given you this money over the course of the, your, your education. Right. So what that amounts to is a lot of times that's seven, eight, nine, ten different payments for, you know, a certain amount per month at different interest rates. So the consolidation allows you to scrap all of that and get it into one payment with one interest rate. So one, it's easier to handle and two, it typically lowers, lowers your, um, your monthly payment as well. So definitely yeah. something to look into, especially if you got so many, one, so many loans, you can't keep track. Yeah. And if you're doing a four year degree, you generally have multiple loans. So you want For to get sure. them all under one umbrella loan. So like you said, you want to reduce your student loan payment and you want to consolidate it all into just one payment. And that'll, that's one of the steps. And, and Robert talks about many other steps that you can use to get a handle on, on your student loan debt. Yes, sir. All right. Anything, uh, anything else, man? No, let's jump into the Robert Farrington uh, interview and, and we'll see you guys on the other side. Sounds good. All right, Robert Farrington, welcome to the Real Estate Marathon podcast, man. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge with everybody. That's This is great. So thank you. Yeah, man. Definitely. I- Got to tell you, I'm super pumped about this one. This is a really important topic near and dear to my heart. So uh, I can't wait to get into it. Um, you mind starting by telling the, the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So I am the founder of The College Investor. And we talk all about getting out of student loan debt, starting to invest and building wealth. And I've been helping people get out of student loan debt and navigate the complex world of student loans for over a decade now. And, uh, you know, as much as you hear about it in the media and everything else, like, I mean, it's so complex and there's no 
one size fits all for anybody. And, you know, the more you go down the rabbit hole, the harder it gets to figure out which way's out. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, that's kind of my story and uh, been helping people online for a while now. Awesome. Nice, nice. Uh, what had prompted you to uh, to start the the college investor? Was that the, were you in a, a lot of student debt? Uh, did you just see well, it, see the way it was going? Yeah. So I started in college because I wanted to talk to people about investing, right? Like that's a lot funner than talking about getting out of debt. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about how to make money and investing in the stock market and even a little bit of investing in real estate. Um, but yes, I did have student loan debt. I graduated with over $42,000 in student oh. loan debt. And uh, my site just kind of started with like nobody reading it until I wrote about my struggle with my loans and my loan service there. And that was like one of my first articles that kind of went viral. And I talked about how my loan servicer was applying my payments incorrectly and I had to go battle them with customer service and everything. And it was super annoying. I wrote this whole thing and oh my gosh, all these people were like, me too. And I'm struggling with this too. And uh, you know, I, I heard the best piece of advice was like, dude, we love all the stuff you're talking about with investing, but we're not there yet. We have all the student loan debt. We're trying to figure this out. Like how can we do both? And so that's really what we've been talking about for the last decade is how you can start building wealth and investing early while conquering your student loans and getting out of debt at the same time. Very awesome. good, very good. Yeah, those uh, student loan companies don't have a tendency to listen to the little guy, do they? It's like David and Goliath's <laughs> situation. So, totally. I mean, it's just it's so complex, convoluted. You're talking to a call center, right, with just some you know twelve dollar an hour person that really doesn't care about you or your financial needs. You know, like if you don't do it yourself, like nobody's going to care about you except for yourself, right? <laughs> Yep. Absolutely. Nice. man. So I got to imagine there's, there's probably a couple of different ways to look at this. You know, you got the, the college grad who is in a ton of debt. You got the person just going into college who we might be able to educate a little bit on how to, you know, leave without a ton of debt. Um, but maybe if we can start with, you know, people who have maybe graduated recently and have a ton of student loan debt and they're looking at maybe the six figure plus um, <laughs> pile of this problem that, that they have yeah. to tackle. Where do they start? So the number one thing I recommend for everyone is get organized. So I can't tell you the, I would tell you actually 99% of everybody I speak to that is struggling with their student loan debt also can't tell you how much student loan debt they have. They can't tell you how many loans they have. They can't tell you what your interest rate is. They can't tell you what individual payments are on each loan. Because when you're talking a six figure student loan debt, you don't have one loan right? You have probably six to 10 different loans with different interest rates, maybe even different types of loans. And so it really starts with just getting organized. Like whatever that style is for you, like go onto your loan servicers website, find your credit report, see what debt you owe, put it on a list, put it in some software, right? There's a lot of free software options out there. Put it in a notebook. Like, I don't know what your style is for, you know, getting organized, but you've got to get organized. You got to list out your loans. You got to make sure that your loan servicers have your correct address on file. So you're not missing notices and payments, right? Because none of us live in the same place we went to freshman year of college at, right? right? Like we probably lived somewhere freshman year and took out loans. We lived somewhere sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Heck, we might've used our parents' address for some of that stuff, right? And so like if your loan servicer doesn't even have your info, you could totally be in default and not even know and been missing these letters and then like getting yourself into a world of financial hurt. Um, and so that's where it starts. Like we can't even have a conversation about what the best course of action is. If you don't know what you got listed out and then talk about the rest of your budget too. Like what income is coming in? What are your job prospects? Like what's all that look like? Then we can formulate a plan. Nice. Yeah, that's so true, man. I think a lot of people just take that mentality of, well, I owe them money, they'll find me, right? But it's all they have to do is send to whatever address they have on file. And if that's wrong, well, you still go to collections either way. And then we got to deal with the credit score, which Larry loves so much, you know, and oh, if yeah, it goes yeah. in the tank. It's a fine well, line between an 800 and a 300. <laughs> not even that. Like, so it's, we're recording this at tax time, right? And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the, IO, the collateral of a student loan is your income right? So like you get a you buy you buy a home, right? The collateral of the mortgage is the home and you don't pay your mortgage. Well, they just, you know, foreclose on your house, right? Well, the collateral of your student loan is your ability to earn money. And if you don't pay your student loan, they take your earnings. And the government has this crazy administrative power where if you get a government payment, they don't even have to go to court or do anything. Like they can just take all your government payments. So it's tax season. And if you're in default on your loans, they will just take your tax return. 
that's it. There's no like ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so I see this whole world of hurt and people are saying like, oh, I never heard, I never heard. Well, it's like one, you knew you had student loans. Two, is your address updated on file? And it's like all they had to do was send a letter to whatever address they had on your student loans. This was probably months ago or even years ago. And now they're just taking your tax refund. They're going to take your, garnish your wages. They're going to take your social security if you kick the can down that far, right? Like you've got to realize that that is the problem and that's the collateral. And then as you make these decisions, you can figure out which way to navigate it. Awesome. Yeah. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to your student loans. No, no, no. One of the questions that we have is when a student can't pay their student loan payments, what, what do they do in that instance? I mean, obviously they don't want to ignore it. What do they do to start, start the process? Yeah. And so that's the scary part, right? Like what if I can't pay my debt or even more so when you get that first bill after you graduate, what happens is, is you default into what is known as the 10 year standard repayment plan. And that payment plan is actually the highest monthly payment that you will ever face with your student loans. If you can pay it, great. But if you can't pay it, don't ignore it. That's actually like the highest monthly payment. There's a lot of other options out there, but if you don't ask, if you don't call, you don't do your research, you know, that's where you get into trouble. So for most people, that can't afford their student loans, income-driven repayment plans are the key. These are amazing plans that cap your monthly payment at either 10% or 15% of your monthly discretionary income. And what that means is if you really have zero income, let's just say that you've never got a job, like the job market was struggling for what you want to do. If you have zero income, well, your student loan payment is also zero. And if you're low income and maybe you have some children, your income, your monthly student loan payment could also be zero or it could be very low. We're talking, you know, 10, $80, like something that's capped to your income. So if you don't make a lot of money, these repayment plans can help you stay current on your loan debt and they can also keep you out of default and they all come with loan forgiveness down the road. It's not sexy, it takes 20 years, but you know, if you really struggle to earn a solid income over 20 years, any remaining balance on your loan is forgiven. Oh, so that's, I mean, that, that was going to be my follow-up question is the loan forgiveness programs. How exactly do you qualify for that? And that's, you have to make a payment for how long? Well, it depends. So that's the other thing is uh, right now with no changes to the laws, like let's just say none of these politicians that are out there talking all these changes, if nothing changes, 50% of all borrowers today qualify for something. Maybe not total loan forgiveness, but something. And there's so many repayment plans or forgiveness programs out there. I've found over 80 different loan forgiveness programs, depending on what you do, what kind of loans you have, where you live. So the most popular one is the one that you hear about in the news all the time, public service loan forgiveness. And it's popular because there's a lot of public servants out there teachers, government officials, you know, state, local, federal, members of the military, you know, that's very broad. And so a lot of people qualify for it. The other thing is, is it takes 10 years or 120 payments and you get tax-free loan forgiveness at the end. And so that's one of the most popular ones, but there's so many other loan forgiveness programs out there that if you just do a few minutes of research, you might qualify for something and not even realize it. Very nice. If there's somebody who, you know, is looking at this massive student loan debt and doesn't want to drag it out for, you know, 20 years to maybe qualify for something like that, what are the, are there, you know, strategies that work specifically to maybe accelerate getting that debt paid off or what are some quick wins for them? Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to your income, right? If you can afford to pay more, it's just a math game, right? Do you want to eliminate your debt, pay less interest and get it done with? Or, can you afford to not to, to do that? If you can, I mean, you can definitely look at refinancing your student loans, getting a lower interest rate and paying it off. But refinancing is what everyone hears because right, it's driven by the banks and banks advertise and they have a lot of money to throw at advertising, right? And so everyone's like, should I refinance and save interest on my loans? Well, the sweet spot for refinancing and saving on interest on your loans is, are you gonna pay off your student loan debt in three to five years? If the answer to that question is yes, well, and refinance, go for it. If the answer to that is no, don't refinance, look at other programs. But maybe in a year from now, your situation changes. Maybe you got to raise at work. Maybe you got a new job. Like nothing that we're talking about also has to be permanent, right? I think that most people need to look at their student loans, reassess annually, and see if they're on the right path. Because life changes, your income changes, everything can change, right? And you got to just continue to monitor it and see if you're on the best path for yourself today.
Awesome. So when you're getting ready to go to college, when when is the best time to start planning this out? Is this something that you should do before you even decide to go to college? Is this something that you can do during college? I mean, what's the your opinion on the best best time to start this? Oh, I mean, like when they're eight, like when your children are like in their like, you know, single digits, you need to have these conversations. And it actually isn't even the college conversation. Really, it's the money conversation. Like, I can't tell you how many parents just don't share any type of money with their kids. Like not like giving them money, but like giving them transparency into their finances. And then, you know, the 16 year old thinks that they're going to have their college paid for. And then mom and dad's like, no, there's no money. And it turns into really nasty things. So it's like, start with your kids early, share with them money, tell them what your budget looks like, tell them what the plans are to save for college. And then just continue to evolve these conversations all throughout their life until they're in high school. And then you need to sit down and have the real conversation about how you're going to pay for college. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Well, this is how much it costs. This is how much mom and dad have. This is how much we put aside for you. Uh, you know, this is what we could do to support you while you're in school, but like, you know, here's what it looks like. And we have to have these conversations with children early because college is more than money, right? It's hopes, dreams, aspirations, but it also involves money and taxes and the government and all kinds of other nasty stuff that we don't talk about as much. So if you don't combine these two early, you just, set up really bad conversations when it comes to paying for college. And that's where also people don't realize what college is all about. College isn't about necessarily education. It is, but you can get educated anywhere. You can get educated listening to a podcast. You can get educated going to harvard.edu and they put all their lectures online. So if you want really world-class education, you can find that. You go to college because you're looking for an ROI on your investment. And that's what we need to talk about just like you would in real estate or in the stock market. You want a return on your investment. So if you're going to invest $40,000 in college, well, you're doing so because you expect to earn more after college. And you're expecting to get skills, networking, career, other things besides just the classes. Because like English 101, you can get anywhere. You could read some books and you literally learn what your English class is going to teach you in college. (laughs) (laughs) So like you're going for more than just that education. You got to keep that in mind because it's an investment and it's an expensive investment. And statistically college graduates do earn more than high school graduates over time. But you know, there's definitely people that don't need to go to college and can earn very good sums of money, uh, you know, with their skills. Maybe it's a trade. Maybe it's joining the military because college isn't for anyone. And it's really expensive to find yourself if you don't know what to do. Dude, there is so much to unpack in that last couple minutes. I don't know where to start, but I think you are 100 percent spot on. That I think that is hopefully it's a generational thing, and we're getting away with it. But you know, as you know, when I was growing up, and it's pretty common to hear in you know people my age is, you know, their parents didn't tell them about money, didn't teach them about money. But then when they got to 17, 18 years old, you had to go to college. Why? Because that's what you do, and that's what you have to do. But oh yeah, we can't pay for it, so go get student loans, and you know you can't you can't yet get a legal drink, but you can sign for a hundred thousand dollars in student loans without knowing what you're going to get for it. And I think you, the way that you looked at college from an ROI standpoint is the way people need to look at college because you're hundred percent right. You can get educated anywhere nowadays. There's so much stuff out there that if you don't need a college degree for what your, your goals are, it might not be worth the money, you know? Right. And I mean, there's still just like that political aspect to it. Like, let's say you want to be a teacher, right? Like you have to get that credential or they don't let you teach. But you know, there's real smart paths to get there. You can go to community college, knock out your undergrad, transfer to a state school, live at home. And you could probably be done with college for like 10 grand and have that credential and go teach. Like you don't need to borrow, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to become a teacher. And it's just hard though, because people think down on community college. But you know what? It's free in half the states. Like you can go to community college, like no one cares where you took, you know, whatever, calculus or whatever the course is you take. Like that's all the same. If you're just going for your teaching credential, get your teaching credential. Same thing applies to anything. Um, But that's where I think in like the tech world, they have all these vocational programming schools now that are popping up. Because you know what? Like Microsoft doesn't care. They just want to know if you can code. (laughs) And like if you can learn how to code wherever, do it and go get working. And, uh, you know, it just we have a whole world of possibilities now. And it's really expensive to overlook 
why you're going to school. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what people, what um, companies do in the next 10 years as lowering some of their college degree requirements from these jobs that don't necessarily need it. You know, I'm not going to throw it. Uh, my wife worked at a, a, a car rentals place right out of college and it required a four year degree to rent cars. Like, yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> There's so. a lot of that. It's so silly that like you need a college degree to become like a manager or an assistant manager. Right. And it's like, really like, you know, there's people that have really great skill sets that don't need to do that. But you know, you put this arbitrary, I call it politics, you know, workplace politics. And it's the same. Like I see people going back to school for like a master's degree or graduate degree because graduate programs in general are the worst ROI. Like that's where, you know, when you see the million dollars in student loan debt, there's over a hundred people in this country with a million dollars student loan debt and they're all graduate degree programs, right? Because the problem is, is graduate degree programs don't have a cap. So undergraduate borrowing, there's a federal cap on how much you can borrow not for graduate degrees. So like they can borrow, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year and then, you know, interest and all that stuff builds and you have a million bucks. And that's where there's no ROI, especially with like MBA programs, things like that. It might be the workplace politics game that you need to play, but in that case, make your employer pay for it. Like I'm not necessarily dismissing the, the value of the degree, but at the cost and the ROI might not be there. But if you're not the payer, well, go for it, right? But if your company is going to demand that, that you have an MBA to get promoted into some kind of management position, well, they should put up the money and pay for it. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Let's and, change this. Sorry, go oh, ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that I liked that, that you said you were mentioning the tech program, which I kind of wanted to, to dive into just a little bit because I, I am fans of uh, Mike Rowe who does micro works and he's a yeah, I love it. of the tech world. And, you know, I actually had told my son who just graduated from college with a two year degree in, in uh, building, building trades and went right into making a job into a job, making more money than I make. So, and I've got a four year college degree in business administration and, and my own real estate portfolio. So, you know, I definitely didn't want to discount that, a little, you know, kind of touch on that a little bit more that the tech world is a great, great return on investment, like you said. So, yeah, I mean, even the trades are a great return on investment and, you know, it's very cyclical. And I think it's also important to take a, a long-term view on this, right? So when the economy does really well, and this is in history, if you look back over the last 150 years, the better the job market is, the less the value of college is. but then it reverses. The worse the job market is, the higher the value of college is, right? And so like, you know, Mike Rowe is amazing. I think going to the trades is great. Um, you know, I know these construction guys that, you know, are making tons of money these days, but then, you know, everything flips and then they don't, right? It's very cyclical, but the same thing can happen in the tech world. You know, things can flip, things can change. Um, so you just got to be mindful of that. But if you build some skill sets and you set yourself apart and you network, you can usually weather those storms regardless of what you get into. Yeah, yeah. So, since we're on that subject of ROI, what are some things that people need to consider when they're, maybe they're trying to shift their mindset of looking at college just because you got to go to get a piece of paper or looking at it from an ROI? How do they start that? Well, the mindset is so psychological because it's your own aspirations and dreams of what you want to do. It is so much family pressure, so much friend pressure. And you're talking to someone that's 17, 18 years old. And you're like, you need to overcome what everyone's telling you to do this. And that's the hard part is that's where if you start these conversations earlier, it becomes easier. There's no right or wrong here, but like, you know, we got to judge kids less. We got to let them explore and try things, but we got to teach them fiscal responsibility as well and help them understand that like, if you borrow 80,000, that is, you know, $1,500 a month every month afterwards. So if you're not making X, you got to live somewhere and rent somewhere and you got to feed yourself and have a car and all these other things, right? Like, so we got to help them understand that. And the earlier you do that, the better, but it's so much just interpersonal family dynamics that there's just no right or wrong way, but we got to just continue to talk to parents really and kids and say, it's okay. Like there's alternatives. I'm a, I think 30% of people to 40% of people should go to college. I think 30% of people should go into a trade type skill or the military. And I think a 30% of people should become kind of entrepreneurs or something else along those lines and just not go that route. I mean, I think everyone's so different and we can't just box everybody in and what's right or wrong or, you know, dad did this. So you should do this and yada, yada. Right. 
Yeah, we've all heard the story about Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard and, and uh, hey, creating Microsoft. Yeah, Bill also. Gates, <laughs> you know, like it, so many of these people have. And it's, you know, that's very rare exception. But like there's also plenty of people that didn't go to college and started a local, you know, trade job or, you know, run a small business that provides for them and their families and does really well. Like you don't need to have a billion dollar company to support yourself. <laughs> like You can have a nice job. And the cool thing is in this online world is that you can do so much of it online in the comfort of your own home, being a freelancer, something like that as well. Awesome. Very nice, very nice. Now, taking a quote directly off of your website, uh, it says the number one dilemma holding uh, black millennials from investing and building real wealth is, wealth is student debt loan, student loan debt. Um, yep. Do you feel that that's, that's changing now that people are being made more aware of it? Do you think it's, it's uh, getting worse in, in the economy the way it is now? Um, do you think we're making progress towards not having crushing student debt? Not at all. And that's the sad part is, uh, you know, it's leveled off a little bit over the last couple of years, but I mean, we're still seeing, you know, 30 plus thousand dollars in average student loan debt when they graduate. And, you know, wait, the problem is too, is it's compounded with stagnant wage growth, right? So like, you know, student loan debt has increased, but wage growth has stayed stagnant. And so it's just eating up more and more of people's monthly budgets because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. It's not about the number amount of student loan debt you have if your income increased proportionally to the debt who cares you could still have a portion to buy a house and you could still have a portion that you could have be comfortable having children with and things like that but that's the dilemma here is it just eats away at monthly income which eats away at gdp which eats away at potential dollars being deployed to any other aspect of life. And it takes years to build the top line so that you can service that debt comfortably so that you feel comfortable buying a house or having children. And it's hard because kids are expensive and people literally, the studies show that people are waiting longer to buy a house. They're waiting longer to have kids because they need that top line earnings to grow to a point where they feel comfortable servicing their debt. And that's the problem is it, it's a delaying factor. It's a, it's a drag, like student loan debt's not a bubble like the housing market, uh, you know, cause bubbles pop, right? So people can't afford their houses. The bank forecloses, the bank sells that house at a discount, gets it off their books. The whole thing kind of resolves itself in a year per property. And so like when you have a lot of them, it takes a couple of years, but it pops, it resolves itself. Problem is, it's like we talked about earlier, student loan debt, you don't pay your loans. It's just a garnishment. It takes 15% of your paycheck. It just drags and drags and drags and eats away at income until we hit that 20, 25 year point. So there's no popping of the student loan bubble. There's just this constant dragging down of people's expendable income. Uh, and, and that's the real problem with this. And that's why it's not getting better because people clearly can't afford it. We're at the highest default rates we've seen in a decade. And it's not popping because it just drags an income, just eats away more of the income. And when people started getting ahead a little bit, well, that garnishment wraps up at 15% and it takes a little more. And that's the hard part. I feel like you're not encouraging people to make more if you're, you know, regardless of what you're making, you're taking 15% off the top of it for these garnishments, huh? Well, you can get out of it. You can get out of default, but you know, it's, it's this benefit cliff thing too. Like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of benefit cliffs where, you know, you earn a little bit more, but you lose so much for this gap period. And we see it a lot on the lower income jobs where, you know, someone might make $15 an hour and they get a raise to $18 an hour, but their net is less because they've lost benefits. They've lost maybe free childcare. It's the same thing with student loan debt because the best ways to get out of garnish or your student loan uh, garnishments is to rehabilitate your student loans. But that requires nine monthly payments first. So you have this nine month period of time where people are still subject to their garnishment but they have to make a payment too. And so it's like, you've got to really have a significant jump in income before they're able to like get out of the, the vicious cycle. And it's like, all we're doing is punishing these people that are down and it, it's not easy. And so, yeah, making a little bit more isn't necessarily helpful. You have to have a sizable jump 
And that's the hard part. And uh, I did a lot of research so I could sound knowledgeable when you came on the <laughs> podcast. So I, I was doing some research the last few days and I've, I'm not sure a lot of people understand that when things go south, if they get out of college and things in your personal life go south, you, you've always got the option to declare bankruptcy, that sort of thing. We've had, you know, we've had uh, podcast episodes on, on that. Um, but student loan debt is one of those things that the government says is not included in a bankruptcy. So the government's always going to get their money. Money, and I'm not sure a lot of people understand that. Is that something, is that an accurate statement on my, my part that does not get wiped away by bankruptcy? Well, it's rare. Let's not say that you can't wipe it away in bankruptcy. It's just very rare to get it wiped away because once again, what's the collateral? The collateral is earnings. So when you go to a bankruptcy judge and they have all your debts there, and they're looking at your student loans, particularly, let's say you include them and the judge is looking at it and they're like, well, you make no money. Why aren't you on an income driven repayment plan paying $0 a month? Why would I eliminate this debt when your monthly payment is zero? There's no reason to. And that's the problem that people don't realize is why you're not getting a discharge in bankruptcy. It's rare because if you actually are disabled, well, there's disability discharge on your loans. They get forgiven. Okay. And if you don't have any income, your monthly payment is zero. So the judge looks at you like, why would I forget or discharge it? It's just, you have to have a very rare circumstance of, you know, maybe it's private loans and there's some healthcare issues and you make just above the poverty line, um, things like that, that there are some cases. It's just, it's so rare to get them forgiven because there's so many options. And as long as you have a potential to earn money in the future, the judge is going to make you pay them or set it as an income driven repayment amount and you're going to pay. And if you earn more, it's going to pay more. It's just, that's the problem. It's people don't realize that collateral piece. Yeah. And, and the reason I brought that up is I just wanted to, you know, like you and Mike had said earlier, you, you just can't ignore the situation. They're not going to, it's not going to go away. You gotta, you gotta head it head on and try and figure it out. And that's where your websites come in. Um, that's kind of leading me up to, you know, you've got a, another company called loan buddy that I was doing some research on. And could you talk to us a little bit about uh, the student loan counseling and things that you've got going on with loan buddy? Yeah. So we created Loan Buddy to be a DIY solution to help you navigate your student loan debt. So we've talked in like this short period of time of so many options and forgiveness programs and repayment plans. It's confusing. So what Loan Buddy does for free is you put in all your information. I'll tell you the best repayment plan. And you can take that. And you can go do it yourself. I'm not here to try to like scam you or anything like that. But we do have some paid upgrades. If you want your paperwork done, if you want some tracking tools, if you want to know if you're qualified for PSL, LF and the government actually says you're qualified. Like we track all that within Loan Buddy. You can upgrade and get those paid services. But the problem with student loans is there's a lot of options. There's over 150 different options for your loans, believe it or not. And that's where you get analysis paralysis. There's just so many options. Am I doing the right thing? Am I, you know, getting the best payment I can? Do I qualify for loan forgiveness? And that's what Loan Buddy seeks to solve. And, you know, there's also a bunch of financial advisors that use it. So we have two parts of the business. One part is the direct to consumer, but one part is financial advisors that use it to advise their clients. But these are financial advisors that are extremely knowledgeable in student loans as well. They use our software and you can connect with those advisors if you're looking for someone to help you navigate it. We recommend that for high earners, people with complex situations, a lot of like doctors and professionals like that, that are married, uh, that there's a lot of levers you can pull with your student loans. Um, but it requires so much planning and different things. So, you know, something to consider as well. Would that be a good place to start? If you think, if you're thinking about this person who just graduated with a ton of student loan debt and you know, people are, you talked about how people are putting things off till later in life. You know, people aren't getting married or having kids till their late twenties now when it used to be, you know, average of 24, you know, a couple right. of decades ago, right? Um, somebody who graduated, but doesn't want to put that off five years. Do you recommend, is there a, you recommend them to maybe put some things on hold and take care of their student loan debt or to manage the payments going income driven so they can start maybe doing other things like buying a house, having a family and things like that? Or how do you kind of help them decide which way is best for them? Yeah, I'm a huge believer in financial balance. Make sure you're servicing the loans for as, you know, what you need to. Don't, ma don't go into default. Get your monthly payment that you can afford, but start investing. Because the other thing is you can, the biggest thing when it comes to investing is time. It doesn't matter how much you throw at it. It's time. So you're never going to get 22 back. You know, like if you can only put a hundred dollars a month in, and even if that's just like a 401k match from your employer, 
do it. Because if you wait until you're 30, like you've lost eight years of time that you're just never going to get back. And all that means for your future is you're going to have to throw so much more money at it to make up for the lost time. And so I'm a big believer in taking advantage of free money especially if you can't afford it. So we said 401k match, maybe HSA match. A lot of employers are doing that now. If you guys are familiar with the health savings accounts Um, and some of those aren't even matches. Like a lot of those are like, we'll give you a thousand dollars if you get your annual physical, which are even better. Like you're not even have to throw your own money in. you can just get free money from your employer. Right. But you can invest that. And you just do that every year until you start getting a little more cushion in your budget and then you can reassess. But don't dismiss the free money early on and finding that balance of saving and investing and paying off your debt because it's a matter of time too. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, time in the market is better than time in the market. And that's why I get kind of, I'm not going to say concerned, but you know, you hear the Dave Ramsey's of the world and they say, don't don't invest a dollar until you have every cent paid off. And you know, I think there's... Yeah there's a lot of concern with that advice, especially like you said, you're never going to get 22 back in those eight years between 22 and 30, man, from a compounding standpoint, that can do just wonders when you're ready to use it, you know, 20, 30 years later down the road. Oh, hundred percent. And I'm with you. Like that's one piece of advice I do disagree with Dave on uh, because you know, like, let's just say your employer matches you 5%. Like one, you're not even going to notice the 5% out of your budget, but two, you're giving up a 5% bonus on your money. And it's like, why are you leaving free money on the table that like literally could be going towards your future? And, And that's crazy because you know, like it's a pre-tax deduction. You're barely going to notice it. Like put the money away. You might not have anything outside of like that kind of thing early on to invest and save, but like take advantage of what you can and you won't regret it. I've never heard anyone say, man, I regretted putting all that money in my 401k when I was younger. Like no one says that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Nice. Now you, you've talked about addressing the, the debt side of it. Uh, you have some some information on your website about the income side of it. Uh, how would a person go about taking care of both sides? You know, getting an extra, say, hundred dollars a month, or creating multiple streams of income. I mean, what are your recommendations for these new students coming out of college for building up their income? Well, that's what I'm most bullish on. And it's my story, right? So I had $42,000 in debt. I paid it off in about three and a half years, but I did it by side hustling. So I got my job and I was working, but then I was also selling stuff and flipping it on eBay to the tune of about 2000 bucks a month. I started a blog. Like you can make so much money today on the side. And it's like, what are you doing? Nobody's really working 80 to hundred hours a week. That's very rare especially when you're a new entry level employee, you're maybe working 40 to 50 hours a week. And when you're young, like in your twenties, you probably don't have kids yet. Probably don't have a significant other yet. Like you have this time in your day. So when you get off work, what are you doing with your hours? Are you just sitting and watching Netflix? Are you, you know, playing video games and spending money versus earning it? So I'm just a big fan of going out and earning it because for most people, a hundred dollars a month can be game changing and you can earn a hundred dollars a month, like driving for ride share for like eight to 10 hours. And so, you know, you do that for an hour a day for two weeks, boom, you have it. It's not sexy. Your friends are going to judge you and think you're really weird. And your family might be worried about your safety, but you know what? They're also going to judge you in five years when you're debt free, you're achieving your financial goals. And they're like, dang, like, how did he get there? Like, I don't understand. Like, you know, but because they're all going to forget that you were driving for Uber for two years, right? Like, it's just funny how people do that, but it's, it's so much mental, like psychology that you think that people are going to think of you weirdly, but like, you know, they also will judge you when you're successful. So just go earn more money when you have the time and ability to. Heck yeah. Awesome. Um, are, are millennials not investing because of student loan in debt, loan debt? Are you seeing them not get in the market and wait until, you know, late twenties to even think about investing? Um, and if so, why do you think that is? It's just, I mean, education or? Yeah, they were. So like they are investing much more these days. Uh, But yeah, there was a significant delay because, you know, millennials now, like they're in their late 20s and early 30s. Like they were definitely... 
And I you know, like, extra millennials have, you know, over a hundred grand net worth when that, you know, wasn't thought of five years ago on average, you know? Right. So they definitely delayed investing, but there's a couple things. They don't also trust financial planners. So they don't invest in the traditional ways that I think a lot of people thought of. And uh, the rise of all these apps have actually made it easier for millennials to invest, but you know, they're not investing smart. I don't think, uh, you know, when you see the Robin hoods and the stash and the acorns, like it's great that they're putting some money in, but they're also trading and doing things that they shouldn't. And maybe that's okay because they're going to learn some lessons early on in life and maybe change their ways, but they need to invest. They need to invest more. Um, and they're starting to, they really are, but we also have enjoyed a 10 year bull market that may be changing. And, you know, so when they invested less, they got outsized returns that they might not see going forward. And so it's hard. Like you, they just got to do more of it and continue it. And then it's going to be a really interesting year, I think, and how they handle changes. Cause you know, statistically it was inevitable that we were going to see a change in the course of the market. And uh, you know, it's probably a lot of millennials first experiences in a potential downturn right? Um, They grew up in 2007, 2008. They didn't really have any money to see it. Maybe they saw their parents and stuff. And uh, now they're experiencing it themselves for the first time. Thanks a lot, coronavirus. Yeah. (laughs) Everything. I mean, it's just a conflict. It's statistics. You can blame it on one thing or the other thing, but like when we're at a historically, the second longest bull market in history, yeah, like just stats. I, yeah. I don't know what's to blame. It's just, it's just, it's going to, it. yeah, you know, like it literally you can, it's like roulette, right? You can keep spinning and hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. You're going to miss at some point in time. Like yeah. the statistics are against you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you've got the loanbuddy.com. Do you, does that basically with the, the upgraded version of it, does that offer a one-on-one coaching program where you actually help them fill the paperwork out for them and do that sort of thing? Do you have any <laughs> programs for coaching? No. So the system actually takes care of all that for them. So it's a DIY handles it. Um, I've actually gone away from one-on-one coaching, but we also connect you with the financial planners because that's the thing with student loan debt is the enemy of student loan debt is the scam companies. There's so many scam companies that prey on them and robo calls and things. And, uh, you know, we don't want to be, I don't want to be a coach for you and know your financial life. That's why we have financial planners that are literally CFPs and CFAs and they are licensed professionals that have a fiduciary responsibility to you. Or we have the DIY approach where you can get all your information, put it in and do it yourself. Or you can just use our tool, validate what you're doing and go do it yourself 100% without upgrading. Um, And so I've gone away from the coaching, but we definitely have a range of offerings, kind of whatever suits your needs. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Wow. And um, one more for you, actually, is you, people hear a lot about, um, you know, not wanting to get their kids in the same debt that they that they got in is in 529 plans are thrown around a lot. You think that's an effective way to save for for future college generations? Or are there there are better ways to do it? No, I think a 529 plan is one of the best ways to save for college. But this is what I also say is it's the airplane analogy, right? You got to put the mask on yourself before you put it on your kids. And for a lot of parents, they see this with their student loans and they're like struggling and maybe they're also taking care of their parents. Right. And they're like, oh, I don't want to be a burden to my kids. Well, the best way you could not burden your kids is to handle your own financial house. <laughs> like literally save for your own retirements first, make sure your debts paid off so that when your kids are in their thirties and having kids, you're not having to move back in with them and be a burden, right? And so that's number one. Number two is 529s are great, but how I think that most people should be leveraging them is asking people instead of a gift, give to my kids 529 plan. And we've started this in our family and it's worked out really well because I don't know if you guys have kids. I have two and my gosh, like they have a birthday or Christmas. It's like Santa gives them a gift. We give them a gift. Their sibling gives them a gift. And then it's like grandma shows up with two other grandma shows up with two. It's like the kid has 40 presents by the time Christmas is over. But then literally on December 26th, they're playing with two of them. (laughs) All the rest of them are literally not even touched. And so one of the things we've changed is that we've asked all the extended family, like stop buying them crap. No one needs the crap. Like if you want 
want to, you don't have to, but like send the money into their 529 plan. And that's worked really well. They usually get, you know, every grandparent's giving them 50 bucks into their 529 plan. But here you are six years later, they each have a few thousand bucks and that's just continuing to grow. And we get the added win of the kids now getting five to six presents for Christmas instead of 40. And they're still just as happy. Like no one's any less. It's a win, <laughs> win, win right there. Yeah. 100%. And you know, now instead of them throwing away 50 bucks at Target or Walmart buying a toy, they're giving it to something that's going to actually be very valuable. And so I'm a huge believer of that huge believer in 529 gifting. And of course, if you do have any extra money, you can throw it in there. But that's after you've saved for yourself first as a parent. Take care of yourself, your retirement, your needs. Then look at a 529 to save for college directly. Awesome. Oh, this has been a lot of information for, for the people. And I appreciate you coming <laughs> on and, and uh, giving this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, that was been fun. We could talk for hours on this, man. I think it's such a such an important subject today. Um, and uh, yeah, there's where, where can people uh, go to find out more about this and uh, connect with you more if they need to? Yeah, so you can go to thecollegeinvestor.com and we have all this information there. If you want to you look at Loan Buddy, you're trying to deal with your student loans, you go to loanbuddy.us and you can enter your info and get started for free and see if you're doing the right things with your loans. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Great information. Thank you for helping our, our uh, listeners get uh, get a handle on their student debt. Yeah, man. Thank awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you, guys. All right, Larry. That was Robert Farrington, man. How good was that? Man, I didn't know a lot of the stuff that he was talking about. It's It just uh, you know expands your knowledge base a little bit when you start finding out some of the different methods and, and some of the the size of the problem in the country today, you know, the, the epidemic of student loan debt, people coming out of, out of the, out of college with record amounts of student debt. That's just phenomenally bad for everyone. So. <laughs> yeah. And bad for, yeah, bad for everyone. Like you said, the economy, people are doing things that way later than they used to historically because, because of the student loan debt, people aren't buying houses. People aren't starting families and having kids. Those are really um, generationally, those are big things for what spur the economy, you know, down the road when those kids, you know, start entering the workforce. So yeah, this has like large, large implications um, to our future, you know, economic outlook. So um, yeah, definitely a big problem. Kind of we teed up in the intro it's it's such a crazy problem and you know such a a large problem to tackle when people are looking at such a large amount in student loans so it's really it's really awesome that robert was able to come through and give some advice and give some resources for people who might be tackling this yeah yeah and you know and i've got my my kids are 23 and 21 and they both just graduated from college and you know they they can't really afford to take on all their own bills right now you know it's right. it's tragic i they're still on our cell phone bills our car insurance things like that and and our the pair basically my wife and i are trying to help them as best you can but you got to try and give them a leg up but robert is one of those ones that i'm actually going to send this uh, this podcast on to them and say, listen up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and actually, since we're on the subject, man, on a future episode, we'll, uh, we'll have to dive a little bit deeper into maybe how to do college, um, a little bit cheaper without leaving it with, with, you know, this massive amount of debt. So maybe we'll have to find an expert in that space around college hacking and, and, you know, getting as much financial aid and, you know, financial, you know, grants and things like that as possible. So we can, you know, maybe instead of worrying about how to pay off the debt, how to not get in debt in the first place, place through college but yeah and as i mentioned on the podcast you know well, micro works micro is a big proponent of the tech schools and that's where we sent my son and i'm i'm a huge proponent of the tech schools you know nice. you don't have to go to college uh, for something that's just you know educational you can go with educational tech and and get a job right out of college making probably more than i did more than i would do like my son did <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i'm right. a little jealous you mean- of him <laughs> You mean I shouldn't spend 60 grand or 80 grand on a philosophy degree? Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying if that's what you choose to do, um, uh, you may you may have a difficult time finding a job after that. Or right, you, may yeah. not. you never know. But don't discount the tech schools. You know, you shouldn't feel bad about going to a tech school at all. 
it's so yeah no i lo- i love robert's um view around looking at college from the, the roi lens like yes i am going to get this degree but what is my return on this investment going to be and i think that is um nobody i never have thought about college in in that sense before and i think that that's kind of that mental shift that needs to happen when we're looking at college yes it can be a useful tool but what am i going to get out of it in return is it going to have the roi the return on investment um to, to make it worth the six figures that it might cost you to get that college degree. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, start thinking about all your options and, and make sure that, uh, make sure you pick wisely for the return on your investment. Right. So now sure. what's the, what's the call to action we've got tonight, Mike? Our call to action um, from Robert was just get organized. If you are working through it, starting um, trying to tackle this, this kind of, massive problem and sometimes kind of this David and Goliath type situation where you're dealing with such a massive um, debt, you know, just get organized. We, we had a show back, I don't know, four or five now, I think was assessing your financial situation um, where we talked about how you can organize your debts in a way that makes sense and you can tackle them efficiently. Kind of the same thing here. Get all of your student loans, figure out who you owe money to, to what amount in the interest rates. And that'll just give you a starting point for the for the the game plan, right? You need to have a game plan for this debt. And if you don't know where you're at, you're not going to be able to make that game plan. So once you have that, there was a couple of resources that uh, Mr. Farrington uh, mentioned that you can go out to, which was Larry, if I'm remembering correctly, it was loanbuddy.com. Loanbuddy.com. was one of them. Uh, uh, actually, loanbuddy.us, uh, wasn't it? I think loanbuddy.us us loanbuddy.org. Um, and the assessing your financial situation while you're looking that up on Google, um, I believe was episode three or four. So that was more like uh, 37, 38 episodes ago. Cause you can believe we're almost up to the 50th episode. We need to nice. do something special for our 50th episode. Yeah, we should. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah. Loanbuddy.us. You are correct, sir. So, yeah. so loanbuddy.us is the, you know, go in there and it's a free service that he, he offers and it helps you get to the point where you can get a handle on your, your student loan debt. Yeah. All right, man. Any, uh, anything else? No, that's everything I've got. Re-listen to it. If you need to go back to listen to episode three or four, assessing your financial situation and, uh, you know, just get a handle on it. Awesome. Cool. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Real Estate Marathon Podcast. See you next time. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Marathon Podcast. If you found value in any of the content from this show, consider supporting us in the following ways. Subscribe to the Real Estate Marathon Podcast. Leave a rating and review. Continue the conversation with like-minded individuals on social media by heading over to the Real Estate Marathon Podcast Facebook group or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Real Estate Marathon Podcast.